I got to tell you a marvelous radio story. For years and years, we always listened to Jack Benny. Who didn't? Really the greatest, I think, single performer on radio that ever was. I mean, just absolutely brilliant. He could take ten minutes of dead air and make you fall on your face laughing. And if you remember, Ronald Coleman was always the next-door neighbor of the Bennies. And the Bennies, who were so chintzy and cheap and, you know, never had enough of anything, were always going over to the Colemans to borrow a cup of sugar or a peg or something. So anyway, lap dissolve for a few years. This shows you how much in love with radio I was. I did a film with Ronald Coleman, and he and his wife asked my wife and myself over to dinner. And we knew where Jack Benny lived. We'd always known where Jack Benny lived. One of the sort of landmarks of Hollywood. So we got in the car, all dressed up, went down, went next door to Jack Benny. Went up to the front door, next door to Jack Benny, rang the bell and said, Mr. and Mrs. Coleman are expecting us because they didn't live there at all. <laughs> Not at all. Nor did we know where the hell they lived. And we finally had to call the Screen Actors Guild to find out where the Colemans live. I always took it for granted they lived next door to Jack Betty. You know? And in his basement was a vault with all those chains around. Oh, marvelous man. <laughs> Blue night and you along with me. And if a sponsor liked the violin player, he had a violin player on his own. The people may not like violin players, mm -hmm. as proven by Jack Benny's career. He was forced into comedy off the concert stage. I didn't mind it when you scraped that overnight bag two weeks ago <laughs> and called that playing the bees. Yeah. But when you stand here tonight and set that whooping cough to music <laughs> and call that singing, you're going too far. Oh, you didn't like it, huh? Some Jack kind of always a... referred to him as his nemesis. <laughs> yeah, he says, well, the nemesis character, because, yeah, I played a variety of things, but they were all the same fella. Yes, sir, is there anything I can do for you? I beg your pardon? I said, is there anything I can do for you? Yes, we'd like to buy some magazine. <laughs> well, those guys all came up through the ranks, you know. I mean, they knew what they were doing. Because when you're around Benny, you were around the guy that he and Fred Allen and what? guys like that, they're timing. You heard me. Mister, mister, put down that gun. Shut up. Now, come on. Your money or your life. Is it all a dream? The joy supreme. <laughs> Look, bud, I said your money or your life. I'm thinking it over. <laughs> Everything was gone over the airwaves, you know, it was sound, and everyone could imagine what a person looked like, mm -hmm. what a situation looked like, in their own minds, by sound effects and by the person's voice. So today we bring you a man who was run out of Waukegan, Jack Benny. <laughs> Anyway, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Betty talking. And Don, for your information, I wasn't run out of walk It was merely a request by the city fathers and mine. <laughs> and being a sharp guy... Just... Welcome to Breaking Walls, episode number 88. My name is James Scully. Tonight on Breaking Walls, we spotlight the 1945-46 season of Jack Benny's Lucky Strike program. The radio character Jack Benny portrayed was pompous, wimpy, cheap, self-absorbed, conveniently forgetful. In truth, his on-air persona was a fraud, a myth, a creation. Then he had a giant heart, and he was the ultimate joke feeder. The supporting cast got most of the laughs at Jack's expense, and he got just enough comebacks in to keep people rolling on the floors for the better part of three decades. The 1945-46 Benny season was particularly important. Several new characters joined the cast, and one old one returned from the Navy. And thanks to an ingenious marketing ploy, the show enjoyed a sustained rating spike. 
The campaign was the I Can't Stand Jack Benny contest in loose conjunction with the final U.S. war bond drive. There were prizes totaling $10,000 in victory bonds. In the three weeks between December 2nd and Christmas Eve in 1945, more than 275,000 people submitted entries. If this is your first time listening to Breaking Walls, welcome to the show. You can find this show on every podcast platform and at thewallbreakers.com. Tonight's opening theme song is Love in Bloom, originally recorded by Bing Crosby for the film She Loves Me Not. It eventually became one of Jack Benny's signature compositions. If you're on Facebook, join our Wall Breakers Facebook group to keep in touch with news like Burning Gotham, our completely original audio drama series that will be set in antebellum mid-1830s New York City and debut later this year. The teaser is available in this show feed and at thewallbreakers.com. Expect trailers to begin this winter. I'll have news and subscription information in the next six weeks. You can also support these shows for as little as $1 per month at patreon.com slash thewallbreakers. How long were you on for Jell-O? Oh, for a long time, General Flew Jell-O, and then when they had enough of that, we went on. We stayed with them for Grape Nuts Flakes and Grape Nuts and all this and that. And then, I don't know what happened with that. We were on for years and years and years. And then I went with Lucky Strike. I think Lucky Strike made me a, a bigger, better deal, whatever it mm. was, so I went with Lucky Strike. <laughs> Jack Benny began on radio with NBC's Blue Network in 1932 after a guest appearance on an early incarnation of Ed Sullivan's talk show. And I got it through the Ed Sullivan show. The sponsor? Uh, the Canada Dry Ginger Ale. They heard me on the Ed Sullivan show, and as soon as that show was over, they called me and uh, made me an offer. What happened was, I was in New York, and Ed said, Jack, why don't you come on my show? He did a sports show or something. I said, well, what will we do? He said, what will we do? He said, oh, let you and I sit down. We'll write something. dry humorous and famous master of ceremonies, Jack Benny. So we sat down, and there wasn't much to the show except little talk, but evidently the agency for Canada Dry Ginger Ale perhaps liked my speaking voice, because that's all he could go by. And they made me the offer right away. By that I mean I'm finally getting paid, which of course will be a great relief to my creditors. I, uh, I really don't know why I'm here. I'm supposed to be a sort of a master of ceremonies and tell you all the things that will happen, which would happen anyway. I must introduce the different artists who could easily introduce themselves and also talk about the Canada Dry made to order by the glass, which is a waste of time, as you know all about it. You drink it like it and don't want to hear about it. So, ladies and gentlemen, a master of ceremonies is really a fellow who is unemployed and gets paid for it. It was first called the Canada Dry Ginger Ale Program, then the Chevrolet Program, then the General Tire Show, later the Jell-O Program, and the Great Nuts Flakes program. In the process, his show became a hit. One thing Benny always insisted on was a built-in comedy commercial. Well, you had insisted on the comedy commercial right from the beginning. Right and from the very first show. When you had the sportsman on the, was yeah. it the Lucky Strike well, program where they jelly, came in? That was Jell-O, Lucky Strike, right, everything, right. yeah. Well, you wrote most of those, didn't you? Or have a With big my writers, with my writers, yeah, sure. We wrote every one of them. When we started for Jell-O, the Jell-O commercials saved Jell-O because Jell-O was going out of business almost on account of Knox Gelatin was beating Jell-O, beating the hell out. And so they wanted the comedy commercials, figuring that that could be the one thing that would save it. And by golly, it did. It did it. 
By the spring of 1944, the character and sound effects-driven show had been on radio for 12 seasons. But Benny's ratings had quietly been slipping since 1941. Perhaps it was time for the program to undergo a shift. At the end of the 1943-44 radio season, Jack's contract with sponsor General Foods, makers of Jell-O and Grape Nuts Flakes, was up. General Foods had been sponsoring the program since 1934. But there was a semblance of light tension between the two parties. What couldn't be argued was Jack Benny's influence on Jell-O and Grape Nuts Flakes. For example, Ezra Stone was also sponsored by General Foods. I wish we could have been as successful and sold as much Jell-O as Jack, but we didn't have his vast audience, nor did we have the longevity that Jack had. Benny now had full control of his show. NBC also guaranteed his Sunday night time slot for as long as he wanted it. This position allowed Benny to sell his program to the highest bidder. What happened was, the last year that I was with General Foods, so I had a few shows that weren't as hot. But I still had a lot of great shows. This so was in the middle 40s? Thing. The so-called famous Jack Benny yeah. slump, that you yeah. moved from number one to number seven. Or something like or that. Something, right? or, uh, something, <laughs> I don't know. or they thought, so they practically said to me, watch it a little bit, because some of the shows, as though every show had to be perfect, you know. See, I spoiled them. So the minute they said that, and then they went back to New York. Now, they didn't have an option. The thing was over, but they did want to give me a new contract. But the way they said to me, just watch a little bit, I got mad. So I said to my manager, I said, let's get another sponsor. I don't want to be with them. And we wired them on the train as they were going back that we will not be with them anymore because right away I had like four or five big offers from Lucky Strike from everybody mm -hmm. and we grabbed Lucky Strike immediately. All of this activity was being watched with interest by George Washington Hill, the president of American Tobacco. Hill asked his young ad man, Sylvester Pat Weaver, about Benny's availability. Benny's management team quietly held a sealed auction for sponsorship beginning the next season. On February 24, 1944, a surprise winner was announced. Ruth Roth and Ryan, agency of American Tobacco's Pall Mall Cigarettes, bid $25,000 per week for three 35-week seasons. The $2.265 million was payable to Benny for all payroll and production costs. There was an additional $200,000 fund for promotional purposes. The agency and sponsor assumed all network and carrier line charges. The advertising community was stunned. The final Jack Benny program for General Foods aired two days before D-Day on June 4th, 1944. Well, folks, this winds up our last program of the season, but we'll all be with you again next fall. Meanwhile, Mary and I and our whole gang want to thank all you listeners for sharing this half hour with us throughout the season. I also want to thank our sponsor, General Foods, for a very pleasant association over these many years. I know Dennis Day joins us in all those sentiments. Benny then took out a full-page ad in Variety, thanking General Foods and their agency Young and Rubicon for 10 years of partnership. Afterwards, he left in August on a three-week USO tour of Australia and the South Pacific. Everything was going exactly to plan for American tobacco. Pat Weaver and George Washington Hill knew no one would take Ruthroff and Ryan's bid for Paul Mall seriously. But had Foot Conan Belding American Tobacco's agency for its top cigarette, Lucky Strike, entered the fray, the attention would have driven up the price. On August 28th, while Benny was away, American Tobacco announced that Paul Mall's sales didn't justify a $25,000 per week expenditure. They were switching sponsorship to Lucky Strike. They then announced a comprehensive multimedia ad campaign for the show. 
it was estimated to cost $250,000, or $3 million today. Beginning with the October 1st, 1944 broadcast, American Tobacco's Lucky Strike Cigarettes sponsored the program. Gee, Mary, I'm glad you came over to help me straighten out my household expenses. These bills have accumulated all summer while I was away. Aw, oh, Jack, this is Saturday night, and I want to go dancing. Let's go to the Palladium. The Palladium? Mary, with all these bills I'm paying. Gee. But, Jack, it doesn't cost much to go to the Palladium. They charge a dollar and a half for men and 75 cents for women. I know. For you, it's cheap. <laughs> Think of me, a dollar fifty-five just to go dancing. A dollar fifty-five? It's only a dollar fifty. Mary, only a cheapskate doesn't check his hat. <laughs> now, let's get on with these bills. Okay. There was only one problem. General Foods didn't take Benny's exit graciously and decided to go after its former star, using famed singer Kate Smith to do their bidding. They gave me a carte blanche. I could do what I wanted to do. And they were so happy about it, after a month, they put it on five times a week instead of three uh -huh. times a week uh -huh. because they were making great inroads into the opposition network, uh -huh. and so they put it on five times a week. And within, I think I told you, within a couple of months, uh -huh. I had a wonderful sponsor, and for the whole time that I remained in radio, I was never without a sponsor, a big sponsor. By 1944, Kate Smith had become a national institution with 10 top 50 rated radio seasons and countless record sales to her credit. General Foods bought time on CBS opposite Benny's NBC show. The company uprooted Smith's Friday program and moved her to Sunday at 7, directly against Benny, countering with a $170,000 ad campaign of their own. Her first show running opposite Benny featured the cast of Can You Top This? Now Kate sings, Good night, wherever you are. Good night, wherever you are. Unfortunately for General Foods and CBS, the damage to Smith's ratings was much worse. She lost 40% of her audience, dropping to 93rd place in the overall ratings. The following season, General Foods moved her back to Friday. But Kate Smith, never again, had another Top 50 show. 